It's the tuna team known for rally racing, wacky wings, and the sickest escort ever made. But did you know they also made the most successful F1 engine ever? <laughs> episode of Up to Speed where I want more cars in it than any other episode of Up to Speed. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Cosworth. It all started in the 1950s with a couple of blokes from Northampton, England. Mike Cosson and Keith Duckworth were engineers at Lotus, but they felt a little limited in what they could and could not do. So they came up with a plan to start a company on the side, building race engines to their own specs. But like any small startup, they ran into a problem. That's when they went to their boss over at Lotus, big dog Colin Chapman, and they were like, um, Mr. Chapman, we would like to start designing race engines for race cars. But Lotties, that's what you're doing here. Don't you like my engines? Quack, 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 quack. Yeah, like Duckworth said, we love Lotus. We just want to do our own thing. But gentlemen, why do you need me? Quack, quack. Oh, it's money you're after. I love you boys. Here's all the pounds you need. But I have a few conditions. So Carson and Duckworth started Cosworth, a portemion of their last names, which makes you think, would we be talking about them now if they named their business Tin Duck? In 1958, Cosworth Engineering Limited set up shop in a rat-infested old garage in Northampton. Colin Chapman agreed to bankroll the new company, but with a few conditions. Duckworth was free to leave Lotus, but Mike Costin, who had just signed a new contract, had to stay on as an engineer. And Lotus had first dibs on any of the Cosworth engines. Now, Costin would clock out of his job at Lotus and use his off time to engineer over at Cosworth. He did this for the first four years of the company. It's just like how I clock out of Donut and then I go work on my own YouTube channel. Babies reacting to surgeries. Hit that bell so you don't miss any babies reacting to any surgeries. Development soon began on their first race engine. Duckworth had his eye on a brand new type of racing called Formula Junior. This was an entry level class of open wheel racing limited to 1000 cc engines using basically stock engines. It was meant as a gateway to F1 and it would be the perfect proving grounds for the lads. Mike Costin and old ducky boy, as I like to call him, had a working relationship with Ford already through Lotus. So the gents were able to secure two Ford engines that were developed for the 1959 Ford Anglia. These babies were small. I'm talking one liter small. They only made 39 buff pony stock, but the boys tinkered with the cylinder heads and tested new camshaft designs. They got the second motor, the Mark II, up to 75 skinny yet powerful bronies, which is nothing to shake a stick at. Then they sold that engine to Lotus, who dropped it in their Super 7. It was already a stellar car, but with the new Ford Cosworth engine inside, it straight up killed at the track. Lotus Super 7 started dominating competitions. The Mark III engine was an even more powerful version of the Ford inline four, now making 95 mid-century horses. I'm talking Eames ponies. I'm talking Frank Lloyd Wright Clydesdales. This was the first engine Cosworth made that wasn't exclusively sold to Lotus. Other race teams were like, hey, what the heck? We want one of them dang blasted engines too. And Cosworth was like, right on, quack, quack. rock and roll. Quack, quack, quack. The success of their new engines meant that Cosworth wasn't financially dependent on Lotus anymore. Oh no boy, they were free. I make my own money. I buy my own clothes. I do what I want, dad. Quack, quack, quack. It was clear that the engineers at Cosworth could make a banger slapping engine. Colin Chapman knew it and Ford knew it. So in 1966, Colin Chapman played matchmaker and convinced Ford to invest in Cosworth. They signed a $100,000 contract that included the development of two different engines. The four cylinder FBA engine or four valve type A was based on a Ford Crossflow engine block. It featured twin overhead cams, 16 valves, Lucas fuel injection, which sucks, and Duckworth's very own custom cylinder heads. This inline four could produce 225 horsepower at 9,000 RPM. It would go on to dominate Formula Two until 1971. It's an amazing engine. But it was just the start. 
of what was to come. You see, the FVA was just proof of concept for the next project. Calls were screaming. Three liter V8 named the DFV, which I assume stood for damn fast vehicle lightning. If there's one thing you need to know about Cosworth, it's this engine, okay? The DFV was the first engine completely designed by Cosworth. And um, there's one more thing I wanted to mention about it. Oh yeah, it was the most successful F1 engine of all time. <laughs> Think about that, fellas and gals. That's like if I loved saxophone music, which I do. But I loved it so much that I decided to make my own saxophone from scratch. Then that saxophone went on to become the best saxophone ever made. And Bill Clinton would play my saxophone at the Hollywood Bowl. And everybody would clap. And nobody would laugh. The double four valve engine, like its name implies, was basically two of the four cylinder FVA engines duct taped together. Cosworth produced the fully custom cylinder blocks and crankcase in house. The three liter V8 made 410 buff Herspers. At the time, one of their biggest competitors, the Ferrari 312, made the same amount of power, but they used four more cylinders. The first time the engine was used was in the 1967 Formula One Dutch Grand Prix. Colin Chapman threw it in his Lotus 49 and driver Jim Clark took first. That's not bad. That's the first freaking time that they used it. So Formula One is very strict about who gets to use their footage, but we were granted rare access to a piece of film of the Dutch Grand Prix. Please. And Cosworth has done it. They've crossed the finish line and given the check and flag. First time out, and they win it. They win it all. Oh, this footage is so authentic. What an amazing race. What authentic footage. Oh, here they are on the podium. Oh, it looks so real. That feel of authenticity. Oh, look at them spray the stuff. Oh, he's kissing his girlfriend. She's Cindy Crawford. I can't believe this is real footage. Oh, he jumps over those crocodiles like a madman. Oh, there's the pirates. Oh no, the pirates have showed up. The pirates have showed up in these swashbuckling. Colin Chapman swings down on a rope like a Robin Hood and cuts all their heads off. Oh, not only a great engineer, but a great swordsman and a great statesman and great, great, authentic, not at all fate footage. <laughs> <laughs> Cosworth actually made a whole F1 car on their own one year, but it never raced. It was way ahead of its time. It had a four-wheel drive system cooked up by Duckworth himself, a magnesium block DFV engine, and was built using a lightweight wood and aluminum composite. It was supposed to compete at the 1969 British Grand Prix, but it was silently withdrawn because it was too good? We'll never know. Duxter's laboratory continued to develop race engines, but on the commercial side, that's the stuff we can buy, another project was beginning to take shape. Ford of Europe was working on a replacement for the hugely successful small family car, the Anglia. Cosworth had a ton of experience messing with the Anglia's engine, so they were the natural choice to build an upgraded version for its successor, the Escort. The BDA or belt drive type A engine was a 1600 cc inline four with dual overhead cams and 16 valves. It was developed for homologation purposes for a little thing called rally racing. Maybe you've heard of it. We talk about it a little bit. The first car to use the BDA engine was the Ford Escort RS 1600. This thing racked up tons of rally wins. It made 120 horsepower, which was unheard of for a small car at the time. By 1969, Ford and Cosworth were basically BFFs. They raced each other, they did business together, they picked each other up from the airport because that's what friends do, Nolan. Ford would never make Cosworth take an Uber from the airport because they have a weird rash. The RS 1600's more athletic brother, the RS 2000, debutted in 1973. It was slightly more powerful and refined than the RS 1600, with a zero to 60 time of nine seconds and a top speed of 110. 
this car also racked up a ton of rally wins. If you want to know more about all these dang escorts, you can check out the Up to Speed episode, you guessed it, on the escort. We could go on and on about Cosworth's race wins, but that would be a very long video. And I have to go poo poo. So I'm gonna hurry things up. My apologies. In 1975, Cosworth took their already very successful DFB engine and slapped on a freaking turbo. It now made 840 buff yet intelligent horses. The DFX quickly became the standard IndyCar engine, dethroning the dominant Offenhauser, AKA the Offy engine. Now success was not always guaranteed for Cosworth though. In 1975, Chevrolet produced 5,000 Cosworth edition Vegas. Now GM's general manager at the time, a little dude named John DeLorean, AKA Doc from Back to the Future, wanted to improve performance of the Vega following the onset of emission standards. So he sent an engine designer to England to scope Cosworth out in hopes that they would design a cylinder head for Chevy. Cosworth agreed. The next five years were spent troubleshooting engine problems, going back and forth with the EPA, and worst of all, taking away horsepower to meet emission standards. And when the Cosworth Vega made it off the production line, it absolutely 100% failed to deliver. It was originally meant to have 170 hertz per but the final product only made about 110, and it was almost double the price of a base model Vega. They only sold about 3,500 of the expected 5,000 hand-built Cosworth Vegas, and the rest were scrapped. I think that it looks pretty sick, and they did make a 290 hertz per version for the track, but it wasn't enough to sell any road cars. Now, this was the first time Cosworth ever had their name on a production vehicle, and unfortunately, it was a monumental stinker. Their production models would have to be better in the future, or their reputation would suffer. But while the Vega was struggling, Cosworth powered cars were slaying rally races around the world. <laughs> The new RS1800 debuted with the second gen Escort in 1975. This was when we first started seeing features on the rally cars that are now classic Cosworth style. And I'm talking big old wild wheel arches and the signature fitment of high beams on the front for not rallying. The RS1800 had an updated version of the twin cam engine designed for the RS1600. The new engine rules meant they could bore it out and get This is getting ridiculous. I have to do something. I must find him. See if I get any calls. The updated inline four made 245 Hursty hogs and was now mated to a straight cut five speed ZF gearbox. With the RS1800, the Cosworth rally team was basically unstoppable. But do you think Cosworth kicked back and got cozy? If you said yes, you're wrong, cause they didn't. They constantly strive to make their engines better, more powerful, and more dominant than the competition. With production ramping up for a third generation Escort in 1980 and rally racing gaining steam, Cosworth found themselves on the precipice of something great. This decade would produce some of the most iconic Cosworth powered cars ever. Ford had won the World Rally Championship in 1979 with the Cosworth-powered RS1800, but the FIA was about to launch a new rally class that had way fewer restrictions than Group A, or as I like to call it, Group Baby. Enter Group B. 
Group B rules were very relaxed when it came to engine size, car weight, and constraints on technology. Ford did one of those big Oh no, we're gonna need to make our cars better. So the boys at Cosworth took a variant of their twin cam inline four and slapped a big old turbo boy on it. Ew, ew, ew. 1.8 liter BDT engine produced just over 200 horsepower for the street version, but the race version, the race version could make up to 450 buff mother fathers. Ford put a 300 horsepower version of the BDT in their brand new third gen Escort, and the result was the RS 1700T. <laughs> Development of this car turned out to be a huge pain in the earth, because the third gen Escort was built on a front wheel drive platform, which wouldn't be the best for rally driving. Then, freaking Audi came out of nowhere with their quattro all wheel drive system and started slaying the competition. You just kick him right in the nards. Ford tried to scramble to make the 1700T all wheel drive, but ended up scrapping the entire project in frustration before it could ever officially race. They decided that the only way to compete with the all wheel drive Audis and Peugeots was to build an all wheel drive car from the ground up. Ford built the chassis, Gia designed the body, and Reliant built the shell. It was like a group project and everyone did their part and guess what? They all got an A. The result was the RS200. <laughs> Mounted in the middle of this tiny, awesome looking car was the Cosworth BDT engine. The turbocharged four banger was now tuned to make 250 hertz per on the street with race versions all the way up to 444 buff horses at 8,000 RPM and 360 twerk boys. This is one of the coolest Cosworth cars ever made. Ken Block has one. He won't shut up about it. Every time we have a freaking internet car guy potluck, he's like, hey guys, you seen my Cosworth? We're like, Ken, Ken yes, we've seen, seen it. it. He's like, do you like it? We're like, yes, yes Ken, we, we like, like it. it. He is cool though, cooler than me. But it didn't do great in competition. It was too heavy to compete with the Italian and French cars. And one time it flew off of road and killed three people. Uh, Group B is crazy. Uh, and if you want to learn more about it, watch the up to speed on it. For now, Colby, show them how crazy Group B is. <laughs> Cosworth as a company never stopped being in demand. They were constantly approached to work with other manufacturers to develop high performance homologation engines. Mercedes saw the value in their tuning skills and commissioned the company to produce some homologation versions of their entry level sedan. Enter the Mercedes Benz 190E 2.3 16 Cosworth. Add it to the list. The rally versions were insanely powerful and the street versions are literally one of my my favorite looking cars of all time. Cosworth also worked with Opel, helping design a long throw diesel crank engine for a rally version of the Opel Manta and Escana, as well as a two liter 16 valve engine for the Astra and Calibra. Later on, Cosworth tuned a turbocharged 2.7 liter V6 for the B5 Audi RS4, which made 381 hertzpers and had a zero to 60 time of less than five freaking seconds. Uh, if I could have a B5 RS4, I would Probably, I'd probably, I'd do anything. In the early 1980s, Ford teamed up with Cosworth to work on a brand new Group A project. This time, it was for the rear wheel drive Ford Sierra. They needed 5,000 engines to meet the homologation minimum and asked if Cosworth could bring the power up to 180 hertzpers for the street version. Cosworth agreed, but under two conditions. Number one, the street engines had to be at least 200 horsepower and Ford had to not buy five, but they had to buy 15,000 of them. And in 1986, the Sierra RS Cosworth debuted, added to the list. It had a turbocharged two liter YBB engine derived from the Pinto with custom Cosworth cylinder heads, a Borg Warner T5 gearbox, and a massive whale tail? Swallow tail? Let me know in the comments what you call this wing. This is the first car that people started calling the Kazi. The YBB engine made 240 horses for the street version and more than double that 
for the track. A select 500 of the Sierra Coupes were sent to the Aston Martin plant in Tikfa to get the special treatment. What do I mean by special treatment? Oh boy, I'm glad you asked. These Sierras got a bigger turbocharger, better fuel system, a freaking aero kit. They lowered the suspension and most importantly, they got discrete decals that read RS500. So if you looked closely, you could tell. While the street version can make 224 buff horses, the track version made 500. The RS500s dominated touring car racing from 1987 to 1992, winning championship after championship after, after championship, championship after, after championship, championship after championship all over the world. And towards the end of its run, track versions of the two liter engines were making up to 680 horsepower. And the only thing that could challenge the RS500 was the R32 Skyline. That's freaking Skyline, you know? The Sierra Cosworths were doing great in Group A rally racing, but the platform was about to transition into being a front wheel drive car, and the engineers at Ford of Europe had a little idea. Let's take the YBB engine and put it into a smaller all wheel drive car. Why BB? More like why not BB? Enter the Ford Escort RS Cosworth, one of the sickest hatchbacks ever made. Add it to the list. This Kazi had a body designed by Carmen in Germany. It had a wing like the Sierras and significant aerodynamic upgrades on the rest of the body. The adjustable front splitter made the Escort RS the first production car that could produce downforce on the rear and the front. It had a big old turbo with a big, violent entry that came on around 3,500 RPM. <laughs> Just like a Group B car. But most importantly, the production inline four engine sent 224 horses and 224 Turks to all four wheels, which makes it <laughs> a perfect horse port. Guys, we did it. Nowadays, Cosworth is still based out of Northampton and there's still low key upgrading engines. You can get a Cosworth tune up for your AE86 that buffs horsepower up to 280, add it to the list. They even made a limited run of Subaru Impreza Cosworth, add it to the list. The new Honda NSX has an engine that was partially designed by Cosworth. This one does not get added to the list. They totally did it wrong. Their inspiration was like a luxury muscle car. You don't design an They've got a rich, crazy history. They made some of the coolest cars in the world and they're still innovating. They've made huge leaps in hybridization, connectivity, and the future of propulsion. And they're still collaborating. The Aston Martin Valkyrie, one of the most intense race car looking street cars ever, has a 6.5 liter naturally aspirated Cosworth V12 under the hood. With 1130 buff Cosi horses on tap, it's clear that Cosworth isn't slowing down anytime soon. Where are you? <laughs> I love you.